Writing Matters with Dr. Troy Hicks is a writable podcast. Find more episodes and subscribe on your favorite platforms. And if you want to learn how to grow great writers, check out writable.com. In this episode of Writing Matters, we speak with Christopher Bronke. Christopher serves as the English department chair at Downers Grove North High School outside of Chicago where he still teaches one class a day, staying in connection with his students as well as leading his colleagues. He is also the Associate Chair for the Conference on English Leadership, an affiliate group of NCTE. Let's find out more about how he brings compassion, kindness, and vulnerability into the teaching of writing. Welcome to this episode of Writing Matters. Today, we're speaking with Christopher Bronke, who is the English department chair, as well as still a classroom teacher at Downers Grove North High School. He has been in a number of professional roles and is most recently in the role of associate chair of the Conference on English Leadership connected with the National Council of Teachers of English. Welcome. Thanks so much for having me, Troy. I'm really looking forward to uh, talking writing with you. Yeah, well, thank you for being here. I know we've had opportunities during different conference sessions and on Twitter and all over the place. And it's nice just to have some time with a one-to-one conversation. Yeah. And so, yeah. So tell us a little bit about how you've got to where you are. What has your path uh, in education been? um, And now that you are serving as a department chair and teacher um, at a major high school. Yeah. Um, I actually started college as a, a vocal music major. So I didn't really have uh, aspirations or or thoughts of becoming an English teacher. Um, And after about two and a half years or so in that uh, that field of study, I realized that the the thing that drew me to the music part of it the most um, at the collegiate level was all of the music history, music theory courses, the places where I was doing the writing and the analysis. And um, serendipitously, I had uh, one of the music professors was really good friends with one of the English professors. Um, And as a small university, they were chatting and uh, kind of helped me see that that's kind of the path I wanted to go. So um, switched over to English um, in my, I think, 15th or 16th year now in education. Um, I've hit the halfway point in terms of I've now been a department chair for as long as I was just a classroom teacher. Um, so uh, love the current role. It uh, allows me to still teach a class, as you mentioned. Um, I you know, have had some, some opportunities, I think, to move into more uh, full-time administrative roles that would not have teaching and uh, I just just can't do it. Um, so I, I think I get the best of both worlds where I'm at currently. Um, you know, I get to evaluate teachers, which uh, is a lot of coaching, which I love. Uh, and then I still get to teach. I get to design and implement uh, professional development, curriculum redesign work, uh, assessment, you know, conversations. Uh, it's, it's, just, it's just a great great opportunity to, to have your hands in a lot of different places, um, but still grounded in, in working with kids. So um, recently actually started working on my doctorate uh, in ed leadership and administration um, with, at least at the moment, zero desire to use it um, other than to become a more educated human. Uh, you know, I don't see myself wanting to go be a superintendent, although I will, when I f- complete the program, have the endorsement to go do so if I choose. So We'll see where that takes me because about, you know, eight years ago when I was finishing up my master's in ed leadership, I said the same thing uh, with no desire to use it. And then, you know, I've been using it for the last eight years. So uh, anything is possible, but um, I, I like what I do right now. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. I mean, I hear a couple of themes that echo in there. Number one, just the first thing you mentioned was that you're a mentor and a coach uh, to other educators, which you are in day-to-day life and then also on Twitter and through conference presentations and so many other places. And then also the fact that even though you may not use it, you are earning it and you're going through that learning process, which I think speaks really well to kind of the core of who you are as an educator. And I, I appreciate that about you. So Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. And, and you know, it's, it is one of those things where I think quote, as I said, you know, of course, myself, like using it is, is a relative term, right? Like I might not sure. use it um, in my job, but um, I'm already a, a better teacher this year, being back in the role of student as well, uh, reminding myself what that's like, um, and being able to share my struggles uh, as a student with my own students as they struggle. So it's, it's definitely being used, just, you know, maybe not by title. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, yeah, let, let's talk and think about students for a moment. So I know that you probably have dozens and dozens that you could pull from your pocket as you think about the lessons or assignments or particular activities that you use 
with your students to get them engaged in writing. But if you had to narrow it down and pick one that you think is effective and useful and engaging and seems to work year after year, uh, or maybe it's just worked really well this year, the first time you've tried it, what, what's a, a strategy that you've tried or that you've used many times uh, that you find particularly effective? Yeah, I think um, one of the things that I try uh, with varying degrees of success to, to to work with the students on is developing their own voice. I think, you know, too much of um, some of my previous teaching and from teaching that I see from others, um, you know, is so worried about structure and content um, and, and, you know, style is just an afterthought. It doesn't matter. Um, and, and I think there are places in the educational system where that's probably true when we think about some of the standardized tests and everything. But um, in the bigger picture, I think it does matter. Um, and so one of the lessons, this is not one that's going to seem like super scholarly. It's definitely more about craft. So it's, that's also kind of why it's one of my favorites, um, has to do with the students choosing, uh, better verbs for their writing. Um, you know, in some of the work of like Tom Romano and some of the stuff that he talks about, um, really has resonated with me. And so what I have them do, and it's, I try to make it a fun thing. So we start off, they have, you know, blank page in front of them and I say, okay, um, uh, you're going to create a story in real time. Um, it's going to start with, as I was walking down the street, and then you're just going to start writing. And about every 30 seconds to a minute, I'm going to tell you something else that happened, and you can pivot your story wherever you want it to go. So, you know, we start, as I was walking down the street, they start going, and then I'll say, uh, you know, a, you heard a car horn honk, or your cell phone went off, or a, a bird flew by, or, you know, all these different things. And we do that for about 10 minutes, and they get, you know, a good page, page and a half, maybe two pages written. And then they switch uh, writing with the, you know, with a the partner, they, they exchange and the new partner has to read through it and sort of decide kind of what, based on, you know, what's written, what's the kind of overall mood of the piece. Um, and then they have to, changing only the verbs, uh, try to make the mood the exact opposite of what the initial author's piece was. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, there's, again, it's one of those, there's, there's no right or wrong answers. There's no assessment or grades, you know, attached to it. Um, and then, you know, after they do that, they get to read their, basically when, when they're editing, um, they're just putting a, a small strike through to each verb so that both verbs are there and they can kind of look at it and see, and then they have conversations about it and they start to talk about it. Um, it's, it's fun. The kids like it because they, I think at the core, kids do like writing. Um, mm -hmm. And so <laughs> this allows them that space to just kind of write about whatever. They can be a little silly. Um, they can be a little reflective, you know, if they're having a rough day, I've seen them where they're pretty dark. Um, as I was walking down the street, you know, I was uh, filled with shame and, you know, like all, it's like, whoa, 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 not the purpose of this activity, but I love it. Uh, so it, it's, it's just, it just works. Yeah. That's great. And so is that kind of a lead in to a, a bigger creative writing piece or is that just a separate exercise yeah. that you do to kind of get them motivated? How does that fit into the overall curriculum? Yeah, so usually I will do that, um, and it changes. I've had success in both places. Sometimes I do it as the kickoff to the narrative unit, uh, or when we're working on, on writing a narrative, um, just to kind of get them, before we even start thinking about some of those, uh, about mood, um, and then about, you know, the power of verbs. Um, but also as a revision activity, like partway through a narrative unit, you know, when we have a draft done, that needs some revision, we'll do this as an activity, kind of open their eyes to the different uh, aspects of writing that can be revised so that they can hopefully see it as more revision than just editing. Got it. I love the, the idea that it's flexible, right? So I could imagine you might return to that activity a couple times over a semester. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's something you could do as a, you know, once a week is just a little five minute, 10 minute bell ringer, you know, just to get kids writing in an open space about whatever they want. Um, and, and then thinking critically about what it means to revise writing. Sure, sure, absolutely. Well, that's wonderful. Thanks for sharing that strategy. And so I'd like to think um, a little bit bigger now about the teaching of writing and thinking about what you see as some of the trends, the issues, the inquiries, the controversies, the challenges. Mm -hmm. where, where are we at right now in the teaching of writing? You have a, a great view on this from your role in the Conference on English Leadership and the professional networks that you participate in, the blogging that you do, the presenting that you do. Again, hard to narrow down to just one thing, but if you had to choose one item that you think is particularly on the minds of writing teachers, what is it that's uh, happening right now? 
Oh, um, I, I, the, yeah. Um, <laughs> I think that there are, I think there's one in particular in some of the people that I've spoken with and it's, it's, I, I, I don't hesitate to bring it up because I think it needs to be brought up. Um, but it is slightly sensitive. I think in so much as, um, whenever we say that something is missing, it means that we're implying that whatever is currently there is either bad or we have too much of it. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think right now my fear, um, as someone who's, uh, I would definitely call myself a, a writing instructor, um, more than a literature instructor. I mean, I do both. I love both, right? It's like trying to say like, you know, which of your kids do you love more? You know, that kind of thing. But, but if I had to choose which kid I loved more, you know, I would, I would say I'm a writing guy. Sure. Um, is that in all of the conversations going on, um, it, both macro and micro, about uh, more diverse texts, which again, I, you know, as soon as I say that, I don't want this to feel as if I'm diminishing those conversations. I think they're fantastic. Um, I guess I kind of wonder where the conversation is with more diverse types and forms of writing um, that value the diversity of our students. And so and, and it's not to say those conversations aren't happening, um, but I think I, I, would, I would like to see those kind of more in unison um, as opposed to split apart, I guess is what I, what I would say. And, and, and in talking with some other you know, writing people, um, I think there's some similar sentiments there. Hmm. Can you elaborate on that just a little bit? Do you have a particular example of what you would mean by diverse forms of writing that honor the voices of students? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, I, I, yes, I think. <laughs> I, the, the, the diverse forms, I think, just, just having more than students just writing literature analysis every single time they finish a book. I mean, it, it, at its core, at its most basic, simple level. And I know there are, are tons of people, yourself included, you know, who have been leading that charge for a long time. Um, and yet I still think we have a long way to go. Um, so at its most simplistic level, I'm just saying, I think kids need to do more writing than just analyzing a piece of literature. I think in its more nuanced form, um, how are we honoring and teaching um, students to be able to uh, write about them, their, their cultures and, and their own diversity, but also value some of the linguistic um, elements of the different cultures that the kids are coming from, you know, within our schools. Um, I, I'm not sure, I, I'm not sure I have much more of a concrete thinking on that yet because it is still sort of new. And, and because quite frankly, um, you know, I work in a fairly white community. Um, and so part of me is trying to think about what does that mean for my students who maybe aren't exposed to a lot of diversity and how can I use writing as part of that uh, experience and not just the diverse texts. Right. Well, and I can imagine that as in any situation, you, you've got some students who are sensitive and mindful to that. You've got others who, for whatever reason, may not be as sensitive and mindful to that. And then if you do offer them those invitations to move into different genres or to try bringing in different types of language, Sometimes that works well, sometimes it doesn't work so well. And then <laughs> right. you've got to deal with that as a consequence and too. And certainly with the national and conversation going on around race and gender and identity and all those types of things, I'm imagining that uh, your students are bringing some interesting topics to the table. Yeah, one of the pieces that we work on um, and, and are currently in, in the process of drafting a little bit right now is um, an identity letter. Um, and so we spend some time really looking at what, what is the identity um, and how it's different from just like a personality or things that you like. Um, and I guess there's, you know, there's intersection between those, but ultimately an identity being something deeper and, and trying to use some mentor text. We use um, James Baldwin's uh, letter to his nephew um, mm. from the fire next time is kind of a really good example um, of someone who's exploring identity um, in a letter to someone else, but also it, it gives us a pathway into thinking about the idea of audience, right? So like he's writing it to his nephew, but he's also chose to publish it. So what sure. moves is he making as a writer, you know, in, in terms of talking to those two different audiences at the same time? Mm, sure. Well, this is a really timely point that you're bringing up because in fact, right before we began talking and soon after we're done, I will be responding to narratives that my um, freshman students who are in an honors writing intensive course are writing about their identity oh, and great. what they're bringing yeah. to campus. And, and I find it's really interesting because you see this range of students who some are 
and I say this in all the best ways, very quite literal, right? Like I was an athlete, I was valedictorian, I was this, I was that. And then you've got others who are struggling with issues of race, gender, um, privilege, um, mental illness. Like you've got some that are willing to like crack open the shell a little bit. And it's going to be really interesting because they're producing digital ID narratives oh, and love it. they're going to share those as digital stories. And uh, yeah, it'll be really interesting. So it's good to hear that you're engaged in that conversation yourself and with your colleagues at your high school and with your students. So I certainly yeah. appreciate the work you're doing around that. Thank you. So, yeah. So, and this is a question that I know is going to be hard because you're probably going to have at least half a dozen that you could rattle <laughs> off the top of your head. But if you had to choose, one professional book, one website, one uh, app, one software program your students are using, someone on Twitter who you follow and appreciate what they're sharing. What's the one thing that's really just caught your attention right now? What's the thing that either for you professionally or as you are sharing with your students and inviting them to be readers and writers, what is that go-to resource that you're using right now? Oh, um, wow. I, I, you got me stumped here on this one. <laughs> well, you can, okay, you can do two or three. if you Yeah, really well, and I, you know, part of it is, you know, like, I think, you know, for the students, I think I, I like to, you know, kind of stay there. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think there's just so much value um, to bringing in my own writing. So I think in some respects, I want to use that as the answer, as arrogant as it probably sounds when you give me this amazing opportunity to talk about like any mentor uh, <laughs> and, and or, uh, app that's been out there. But um, I, I've recently started doing some writing in some different spaces than just education um, mm. and, and found myself back back feeling uh, like a novice. Um, and I think there, there are times when I write about education where I feel like a novice, um, sure. but, but oftentimes I don't. Um, and so to be back in that place uh, where I'm, I'm, I'm new to the space, I don't have any sort of credit. I mean, I have some credibility. I wouldn't be writing in that space, but certainly not sort of like, you know, what I would have as an educator. Um, mm-hmm. It's just reminding me about, A, the struggles of writing and, and being able to show those and, and, and think aloud those struggles with the students. Um, but it also just continues to remind me how vulnerable writing is. You know, I mean, I think, mm-hmm. I really think it might be one of the most vulnerable things we can do as humans, um, especially when we think about having to share it. You know, I, I can't tell you um, the first piece of writing that I did for, um, it, was kind of, it was in the food and beverage space. Uh, mm-hmm how many times I read and reread my own writing because I was so nervous to put it in that space, you know, and then here we are with our students saying like, Oh yeah, you've got to have this done by the end of the period, please turn it in. And and now I'm going to judge you on it. Um, And so I think it may not quite be what you were asking for, but I think as I, as I look at this school year, even just through the first 25 days or so that we're in um, that that's been a really great experience for me. And I, and I think and hope it has been for the students too. I certainly appreciate what you're saying. And that, that is compelling to, again, you said that twice now in your role in your, your doctoral program and as a writer in a new genre or field or arena, yeah. whatever kind of metaphor we want to use, you're putting yourself out there and you're trying things that are new and you're sharing that with students, which I think is a tremendous resource. And it, I certainly Yes, pat yourself on the back and, and do some kudos because that, that's Thank definitely you. worthwhile. As a follow up to that, I, I wonder then, could you talk even just a little bit more about the impacts that writing has on your life? And then clearly you're writing emails and memos and curriculum <laughs> and things like that. But let, let's focus on those things you were just mentioning. Like, how do you see that act of being a writer and being a teacher writer as part of your identity? Yeah. It is something that I guess 15 years ago, even when I was coming out of, you know, undergrad with a degree in English, I don't think I thought of myself as a writer. Um, You know, one of the professors that actually was part of uh, me realizing to change majors away from music and into English was uh, a writing professor of mine. And and she said on the first day, she's like, you know, you write, therefore you're a writer. <laughs> uh, and at its core, it's that simple. And yet at, at its, 
accepting that is, is tough. Uh, and, and I, and I didn't, and I didn't write for my, you know, the only thing I wrote for my first probably seven or eight years of being an educator was when I was, you know, working on either of the two master's degrees that I have. And, um, and, and then I, I mean, I, you know, I talk about this all the time. I've written about it. Um, it was actually at a CEL conference, uh, the year it was in Vegas. Um, and, uh, Tom Romano and Penny Kittle did the opening session and it was all this, you know, writing and writing to uncover what, that which we don't even know needs uncovering and all of these sorts of mm. things. And, and I left there, um, literally changed forever. Um, and I've talked about that, you know, in, in numerous arenas. And, and that's when I started seeing myself, um, as a writer. Um, and, and that's only grown since I think if, if, you know, talking about identity, um, I, th I think I would struggle at times right now to say if, if the word educator or if the word writer is a bigger part of my identity. Um, mm. and ultimately probably some similarly equal, I'm guessing. Um, but you know, like I said, I've started doing some work in, in other spaces, um, at the expense of putting out as much as I would like to about education. I haven't blogged in, in that arena in a while, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just been a journey. And, and I think what I've learned through it all and what I'm trying to work on the students with and, and what's helped change some of the assignments I give the students is that oftentimes the hardest part of writing is just finding the story to write, you know, mm -hmm. um, once you get that, you know, we're, it, it's not easy, um, but, but you can get rolling. Um, and I think as a writing instructor, that's really shaped the fact that um, I've tried to really get rid of telling kids what the story is. Um, you know, in other words, I guess what I'm saying is getting rid of prompts to some extent. Um, mm. and, and saying, you know, we finished this text or we're talking about this concept. You, you tell me what the story is. Um, mm. I had that the, when this, this uh, glassware company that I, that I did some work for, they hired me to, you know, do a couple of pieces. And I was like, well, what do you guys want? They're like, you're the writer, you tell us. I'm like, uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, right. And it was such a great experience, but like, um, you know, it just kind of continues to remind that. So I guess kind of circling back, you know, to what you were saying in terms of the role it plays in my life. I, I just, I can't fathom it not being there. Um, it's, it's made me a better teacher, better person. Um, I still use it when I'm struggling. Uh, you know, I at times kind of can deal with anxiety issues and writing is, is what I turn to, you know. Um, it just, uh, I, I, the reflection of it is I just never thought that I would, that it would matter this much to me. Um, but I'm, I'm blessed that it does. What a, perfect segue of course being on writing matters as a <laughs> podcast so i really appreciate that yeah. um as you have talked and i think we've mentioned out loud a couple times but i'm wondering as we're coming to a close um if you could mention a little bit more tell us about cell or the conference on english leadership and uh what role that has played of course in that keynote from tom yeah. penny <laughs> uh, changing your writing life but yeah. uh, you are now in the executive uh committee of that organization and it's i know you're active in it um tell us a little bit more about uh, what cell is what you do how it works and how others might get involved yeah i appreciate you bringing this up um so cell is the conference on english leadership um, it's a, an, you know, an offshoot of NCTE, and it is designed for literacy leaders. Um, and it's been fun just in the eight years or so that I've been a part of it, how we've expanded that definition. Um, I think it, at one point in time was actually called like the conference for department chairs or something like that. Um, and, and now, you know, we have everything from uh, team leaders, uh, you know, that are full-time teachers, but lead a PLC to literacy coaches, to department chairs, assistant principals, principals. Uh, there's every once in a while, there's, you know, assistant superintendents, superintendents, you know, it's anyone who leads literacy work. And, um, you know, we do a lot throughout the year and we're trying to continue to do more. We've got a new podcast series that's out. Um, we've had um, our first episode is, is already out and episode two is launching on Monday, I believe. Um, it will be Dr. Emily Meixner and Rachel Scupp uh, talking about uh, their co-teaching relationship as one is a middle school teacher and one is a college professor, and they do some co-teaching and co-designing, um, and also the role and their passion for finding um, LGBTQ texts for their students. Um, so a little plug for that. But, um, it, you know, I think for me, you know, the, the, the national conference is kind of our keynote or, you know, our big event. Um, it, it pairs off of the uh, NCT conference every year. It's at the back end. Um, it's, and it's this just wonderfully intimate space, uh, you know, usually around uh, 175 to 200 people. So you get all the, the big names. Um, 
you know, like Tom and, and Penny, uh, with, you know, only 150 people as opposed to 1500 or 15,000 or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, it's, to me, it's, Cell has become a, really, I think, a, a blessing of a, a true two-way street. Um, it's given me lots of uh, resources and connections and learning and made me a better educator, but it also provides an opportunity for me to sort of give back as well through uh, writing for the blog, uh, you know, volunteering, well, I guess not volunteering, but winning, in, you know, the election to, to be a member at large, which I was, and then also now um, on the executive committee. Uh, we have a mentorship program, so I've been able to serve both as a mentee and a mentor in that. Um, and it's really, it's one of those, the more you give, the more you realize you're getting, and it just keeps going and, and draws you right in. That's really amazing. And if anybody wanted to attend a CELL event, probably the most prominent one would be the one in connection with the National Council of Teachers of English Convention. Do you know the dates offhand when those might be coming up uh, for yeah. 2019? The, the, it's going to be the, the Sunday that NCTE ends, essentially, is what it is. So um, it would be Sunday, November 24th. Um, we start in the afternoon, and then it's a full day on that Monday, and then a half day on that Tuesday, the 26th. So um, I'm able to have all that. So That sounds great. So as we bring our conversation to an end here today, one of the other questions that we've been asking many guests is this, uh, what is the mark that you hope to leave on education as you consider your past career, where you're at now and where you're heading? Yeah, I, I guess I hope that it would be being an example, hopefully, um, for the fact that um, kindness matters. Um, and that, um, that caring matters. Um, I think there's a lot of things I would hope to in terms of some pedagogies and, and such that I've tried and, and played around with. Um, but I think at the end of the day, uh, both as a leader um, and as a teacher, um, I think that, that would be, a, I guess, another way to phrase it is that's what I would hope people would say about me, um, uh, is that he was kind and he cared about us. Uh, and if we have that, we'll figure out the rest. It's amazing. Good advice for life in general and especially for teachers. Yeah. So, thank you. Thank you, Christopher. Really appreciate your time today and what you do with and for your students, with and for other educators, and with our profession as a whole. Thank Great. you. Thanks for having me. Writing Matters with Dr. Troy Hicks is a writable podcast. Discover more episodes and subscribe on your favorite streaming platforms or check out filmed episodes on YouTube. And if you want to learn how to grow great writers, check out writable.com.